helpful and seems to elude others? This was a question that Napoleon Hill had in his early childhood, and he spent his lifetime pursuing that age-old question. Hill sought the answer as to why some are successful and millions are not in a manner that no one had ever done before. Oliver Napoleon Hill was born in 1883 in the remote mountains of southwest Virginia. There appeared to be nothing in his early life that would predict Hill to being a success. Born in a log cabin, he once said, For three generations my people have been born, lived, struggled in ignorance and poverty, and died without having been outside the mountains of that section. Life was very primitive when compared to larger cities in the East. Life expectancies were short with a high mortality rate. Many rural Virginians suffered from chronic health problems often caused by inadequate diet. With little apparent reason to expect success to any large degree, when at the early age of 10, Hill lost his mother, who was only 26 years old, at her death. One year later, Napoleon's father remarried, which was a turning point in the young boy's life. Napoleon's stepmother, Martha Ramey Banner, was an educated woman, the widow of a high school principal and the daughter of a doctor. Hill's new mother saw potential in him that nobody else seemed to appreciate. At an early age, she convinced him to trade his gun for a typewriter, and she taught him how to use it. The typewriter was used by Hill to type news stories by the age of 15 and proved to be invaluable throughout his life. Schools were in critical shape except for the major towns and cities throughout the state. In the mountainous area, elementary schools were only open for about four months of the year and attendance was not required. High schools were rare with only about 100 in the entire state and most offered only a two- or three-year curriculum. Twenty years after Hill's birth, there were only ten four-year high school programs in all of Virginia. It would be remarkable that he could ever escape such a background, become such a success, and influence millions of people in all parts of the world. Hill often referred to his early childhood in his articles, books, and speeches. His recollection of each early childhood memory was mostly negative, and it's little wonder that Hill often referred to his rags to riches throughout most of his career. Finishing high school in Wise, Virginia, a two-year program, Hill began to see himself as an executive. Entering a business college in nearby Taswell, he took courses to prepare for the job of secretary, which would help him prepare for the business world. He chose to apply for a job with one of the most successful men living in the southwest Virginia mountains. Hill says he offered to work for the job paying the employer during a trial period. General Rufus Ayers, one of the richest and most successful individuals, was to be Napoleon's new employer. It's easy to understand why Napoleon Hill, with his background of being surrounded by poverty and ignorance, would want to work for General Ayers. After Hill had completed a business college course, he wrote to Ayers, saying, I have just completed a business course and am well qualified to serve as your secretary, a position I am very anxious to have. Because I have no previous experience, I know that at the beginning, working for you will be of more value to me than it will be to you. Because of this, I am willing to pay for the privilege of working with you. You may charge any sum you consider fair, provided at the end of three months that amount will become my salary. The sum that I am to pay you can be deducted from what you pay me when I start to earn money. Ayers hired young Napoleon, who came early, stayed late, and worked willing to go the extra mile to render more service than compensated for. Going the extra mile would become one of Hill's principles for success. Ayers had the background that would serve Hill well when he began his study of successful individuals and what led to their success. Ayers, as a young man, served in the Confederate Army in the Civil War. After the war, Ayers worked in a mercantile store and read law. He became a very successful lawyer, serving as Attorney General for the State of Virginia, and a successful businessman who helped organize banks and operate coal mines and other business ventures. It was from Ayers that Hill got the idea to attend law school to become an attorney. Hill convinced his brother, Vivian, that once accepted to Georgetown University, Hill could use his passion for writing to support the both of them through college. The information Hill gathered would lead to a life of writing and speaking on his findings on personal achievement. Hill's findings produced the basis for the eight-volume set of Law of Success, 
published in 1928, and Think and Grow Rich in 1937, the best-selling self-help book of all time. The book you are about to listen to will provide you with valuable writings on success before Hill published his first book. Remember, it was 1908 when Hill interviewed Andrew Carnegie, but 20 years before he published his first book. During this 20-year period, Hill was writing, speaking, teaching classes on the principles, and publishing his own magazine. Hill published Napoleon Hill's Magazine and Hill's Golden Rules Magazine. Articles from these magazines compose this audiobook and give valuable insight into some of Hill's earliest writings. Whether you are a reader or listener of Hill's famous works, or this is your first time listening to Hill's writings, you will gain valuable insight that will help you in life. Hill secured a job with Bob Taylor's magazine. In 1908, an assignment sent Hill to New York to interview Andrew Carnegie at his 64-room mansion. Carnegie had come to the United States as a youth with very little schooling. Through hard work and investments, Carnegie became a millionaire at an early age. As the founder of U.S. Steel, Carnegie was 74 years old when Hill interviewed him. Carnegie had given away $350 million from his sale of U.S. Steel by the time of his death in 1919. Carnegie talked about principles of achievement to Hill. Before the conversation was over, Carnegie challenged Hill to interview and study the lives of great leaders and to compile his findings into a set of principles in order that other people could be helped to help themselves and realize their dreams. Carnegie furnished Hill with an introduction to the leaders of the time, such as John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and George Eastman. You will discover why Hill's work is popular all over the world and has influenced the present self-help movement like no other in history. Preface It was 1908 when the young writer Napoleon Hill interviewed U.S. Steel founder Andrew Carnegie and accepted his offer to study successful individuals. Carnegie told Hill, a philosophy of success would help others become successful. Hill gladly accepted the 20-year assignment in order to develop and teach the philosophy of success. Hill gladly accepted the 20-year assignment in order to develop and teach the philosophy of success. Hill remarked in one of his lectures that when Carnegie spoke of the philosophy of success, he went to a library to find out what the word philosophy meant. While living in Washington, D.C. in 1910, he received the assignment to travel to Detroit to interview Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company, who began mass production and made the Ford car affordable for the working class. While Henry was selling Ford on the interview, Ford was busy selling Hill on the Ford automobile. Hill was so sold on the car that he purchased a Ford for $575 to drive home. The money probably came from his new bride, whose wealthy West Virginia parents gave her a wedding endowment. On returning to Washington from his interview, Hill founded the Automobile College of Washington to teach people how to sell cars. Throughout his lifetime, Hill had a love for automobiles. Growing up in a rural area where very few people could afford a car, to Hill and most people, the automobile was clearly a sign of wealth. When his first books were published, he paid $25,000 for a Rolls-Royce automobile, which was a large sum of money at that time. Fascinated by the automobile and with a desire to be a writer that started when he was a teenager, Hill naturally used the automobile in articles he wrote. In Hill's biography titled A Lifetime of Riches, the author wrote, Like millions of other Americans born into modest or impoverished means, Hill was destined to admire the likes of Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, the phonograph, and hundreds of other inventions. Andrew Carnegie, who, like Edison, had very little formal education, founded U.S. Steel. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, and dozens of other self-made men with a passion that bordered on worship. He would become consumed with interest about people who succeed while others fail. Hill dreamed of meeting these giants to obtain their wisdom that produced their incredible accomplishments. But unlike most of the other admirers, Napoleon Hill was destined to fulfill his dreams. He would not only meet and impress America's greatest achievers, 
but he would spend his entire life gathering their secrets to success and communicating them to the world. Hill wrote a series of 15 articles he titled Billboards on the Road to Success. The articles in this book are exactly as Hill typed them on his old manual typewriter. The articles are as relevant today as when Hill penned them more than 90 years ago. Part 1. The Road to Success. 15 Billboards. Chapter 1. Desire as a Definite Aim in Life. You want to succeed in life. You want a home, and you want a little nest egg of money laid away in the bank. Perhaps you want a little automobile of your own and other conveniences with which to enjoy yourself when not engaged in work. You will have all this, and perhaps much more, if you follow the road to success as it is marked off for you in this and other messages that will follow. The road to success has been discovered. It has been surveyed, and signboards have been placed along the way. These signboards tell you just what to do. There are 15 of these signboards, and if you will read these messages and do what they tell you, nothing can stop you from succeeding. These 15 signboards were thought out by a man who is now very successful. He owns his own home. He owns his own automobile. He has a good-sized bank account. He has a wife and several happy children. He is successful and happy himself. He had no one to help him and no advantages, which you do not have, for he started out as a humble laborer in the coal mines not long ago. This man succeeded, just as you may now succeed, by observing these 15 signboards on the road to success. The first one of these signboards is called A Definite Aim in Life. Before another sun sets, you must decide what your definite aim in life is going to be. After you have decided, you must write out your definite aim in clear, simple words. You must describe it so clearly that anyone would know what it is after reading your description of it. Here is how you go about describing your definite aim. For example, suppose that your aim is to be the owner of a home, an automobile, a nice bank account and an income sufficient to give you time for rest and pleasure. You would state your aim in writing in these words. My definite aim in life is to own a home, an automobile, and a nice little bank account, and to have an income sufficient to give me time for rest, recreation, and pleasure. In return for these joys of life, I will render the best service at my command, and I will so conduct myself that the purchaser of my services will be satisfied with what I deliver him. To be sure that my employer will always be satisfied with my services, I will always endeavor to deliver the best I have, regardless of the pay I receive, because my common sense tells me that this habit will make me a very desirable employee and bring me the top-notch price that is paid for the sort of services I am rendering. I will sign my name to this definite aim and read it over every night just before I go to sleep, for twelve consecutive nights. And then you would sign this document. The psychologists claim that any person who writes out a definite aim in words similar to the foregoing and faithfully observes the habit of reading it every night for 12 nights just before going to sleep will be sure to see that aim is fulfilled. Remember this definite aim is the first step on the road to success. And remember also that the man who named these signboards started in very humble work as a laborer in the coal mines with practically no education, and quickly climbed to success. You can do the same if you will follow the directions in these messages. Almost from the very day that you write out your definite aim, you will notice that things will begin to come your way. You will notice that your fellow workmen will be more considerate of you. You will notice that your employer will take notice of your work and greet you with a smile such as you never saw before. Unseen forces will come to your rescue, and you will begin to sweep on to success as though an army of friendly people was secretly following in your footsteps and helping you in all that you do. You will also notice that you will become more friendly toward your fellow workers and your employer. 
You will become more patient with all of your friends, and they will begin to like you more and more, until finally you will have no enemies. Everybody will begin to be friendly toward you, and these friends will help you achieve success. This is a promise of one who has tried the plan and found that it worked. Don't question that it will work as well for you. Follow the instructions laid down in this and then the bulletins that will follow, and one year from the day that this bulletin came into your hands, people who know you will marvel at your personality, and you will find yourself an attractive person whom all will like. You will find also that all who know you will go out of their way to throw opportunity your way just because they like you. Your world is determined by your dominant desire. This is the hidden secret that unconsciously determines attention. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Notice that the phrase in his heart, or as Hamlet once put it, in his heart of hearts. The Hebrew writers, who in the scripture used the word heart as the symbol of man's emotional nature, may have been totally ignorant of modern psychology, yet, as John Herman Randall points out in his Culture of Personality, they grasped the great psychological truth that all thought springs from primary feelings or emotions. Personality, considered as the self-conscious unity of reason, affection, and will, finds self-expression in a creative process that begins first in an impulse or feeling, passes to thought, and completes itself in an act of will. In the last analysis, our world is determined by our dominant desires. Personality is the development of desire. As a man's dominant desire, then so becomes the world of his personality. Or to put it simply, as a man's dominant desire, so he becomes. All men, in the sense of desire, pray. The prodigal's dominant desire was, give me my portion. Perry said that for 24 years, asleep or awake, the one dream and purpose of his life was to find the North Pole. Edison and the incandescent, Stevenson and the locomotive, Fulton and the steamboat, Napoleon and the mastery of Europe, Joan of Arc and the salvation of France, Hall and the spread of Christianity were the answers of dominant, all-controlling desire. Such prayers may be false or true, but prayer is a boomerang. This warns us to keep dominant desire pure and unselfish, in attunement with God's will. Know a man's fixed desires, and you can cast a horoscope as to what he will become. Show me the pictures a man hangs on his walls, the books he has in his library, the movies he goes to see, the sort of friends he gathers about his fireside, and I will tell you the sort of prayers he makes. For these walls of his imagination the sort of things he writes on the fleshy tablet of his heart, the sort of conversation he holds in his dreams, the thought world that is controlling his subconscious mind. If your world is determined by your dominant desire, the only way to create a beautiful world is to think, as Ralph Waldo Trine would say, in tune with the infinite. To think, as the great Kepler said, God's thoughts after him. To think, as the Master himself put it in harmony with the divine will, Thy will be done. There is only one way to do this. You must practice the presence of God. The Master pointed that way when he gave the formula, Enter your closet, shut the door, and pray in silence. The psychologist in all effective thinking. The psychologist and the mystic both agree on the same method to induce the psychological moment to connect at the throne of God. We are not only what we think in our hearts, but also what we pray in our hearts. Prayer brings us into touch with universal consciousness, the mystic love energy of all being, the eternal God, our Heavenly Father. We need to constantly call ourselves into the divine presence. We need to think of prayer less as petition and more as communion, creation, and realization. Prayer itself is the greatest asset a man has. It's not that your child needs to say, Now I lay me down to sleep, for fear God will forget him or fail to watch over him during the night. You teach your little boy or girl to pray, Now I lay me down to sleep, 
that he or she may learn the prayer path to God and come in mature years to identify dominant or fixed desires with God. It works. The Reverend James Higgins told me that until he was 21, he had never seen a Bible, been inside a church, or heard a prayer, save, now I lay me down, and our Father who art in heaven, which he learned at his mother's knee and had prayed every night and morning of his life from his earliest recollection. The first public prayer he heard resulted in his conversion and later consecration to the Christian ministry. A Springfield College student said to me, Mrs. McCollum's lectures on applied psychology have enabled me to realize that my mother's religion is scientific and that thrills me. It is a wise mother who teaches her child to pray. Prayer then, real prayer, is dominant desire Godward, and we are what our prayers make us. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles on the breast. Put your prayer life to pushing, not for God to perform some miracle for you, but to give you the creative energy that you may perform the miracles for the glory of a better humanity. Ask God every morning for health, happiness, and success with your appointed task. Go forward conscious of His energizing. Expect fulfillment. Accept nothing less. The godlike spirit can do the godlike thing. Concentration and prayer become your greatest asset in creating an efficient personality for human service. The verse of Clinton Scollard puts it in a cameo. He wrote, Let us put by some hour of every day for holy things, whether it be when dawn peers through the window pane or when the moon flames like a burnished topaz in the vault, or when the thrush pours in the ear of Eve its plaintive melody, some little hour wherein to hold rapt converse with the soul from sordidness and self a sanctuary swept by the winnowing of unseen wings and touched by the white light ineffable. Some twenty years ago, a southern author wrote a book called Up From Slavery. The man who wrote the book has now passed beyond the Great Divide, but his handiwork stands at Tuskegee, Alabama, in the shape of a monument that will keep his name alive for many generations to come. The name of the man is Booker T. Washington. The monument is the industrial school that he established for the people of his race, a school that teaches its students the honor and glory of learning to work. I have just read Up From Slavery for the first time, thanks to Mr. Lincoln Tyler, an eminent New York attorney. I feel ashamed for not having read it many years ago, because it is a book that every young man and woman ought to read early in life. If you become discouraged now and then, go to the library and read this book. It will show you real cause for discouragement. Booker T. Washington was born a slave. He did not even know who his father was. After the slaves were set free, he felt a burning desire to educate himself. The word desire is printed in italics because this word has an important meaning as it is used in this particular instance. Washington heard of the school at Hampton, Virginia. Without funds to pay his way or to pay for his traveling expenses, he set out from his little shanty in West Virginia to walk to Hampton. In Richmond, Virginia, he stopped for a few days to work as a laborer on a boat that was unloading. His hotel was a board sidewalk, and his bed was the cold mother earth. He saved every cent received from his labor on the boat, with the exception of a few cents a day he spent for coarse food. All night long he could hear the tramp, tramp, tramp of footsteps on the sidewalk above him, from which we judged that his quarters were none too pleasant. But he had a burning desire to give himself an education. And when men have this sort of a desire for anything, no matter what may be the color of their skin or the size of their pocketbooks, they usually get it before they stop. When the work on the boat was finished, Washington turned his face Hampton word once more. Arriving there, he had but 50 cents in capital. They looked him over, heard his story, 
but did not indicate whether or not he might enter as a student. Finally, the woman in charge of the school gave him an entrance exam. It was quite unlike the test at Harvard or Princeton or Yale, but nevertheless it was a test. She asked him to step inside and clean a certain room. Washington went to the task with the determination to do a good job, for he had a burning desire to enter that school. He swept the room four times, then he went over every inch of it with a cleaning rag four times. The woman came to inspect his work. She took her handkerchief and searched for a speck of dust, but the search was in vain. No dust was to be found. She said to the young lad, I guess you'll do to enter this school. Before Booker T. Washington died, he had raised himself to such a position of honor that he rubbed elbows with kings and potentates, the rubbing being always at their invitation. He sought no prestige. As a public speaker, he swept his audiences before him. His style was that of simplicity. He used no big words. He did not foreflush. He acted naturally, always. His simple, direct, straightforward manner made a place for him in the hearts of both his own people and the white people of the United States and many other countries. A lesson here for all who seek glory and honor in any calling. Washington taught his people to give more time to learning how to lay bricks and build houses and raise cotton than to the study of dead languages or literature. He understood the real meaning of the word educate. He knew that education means developing from within, learning to render a needed service, learning how to get all that was needed without interfering with the rights of others. Tuskegee, Alabama is now one of the most progressive of cities. It is known for the achievement of the school that Washington founded, not only all over America, but practically all over the world. The school property within itself constitutes a splendid city. Booker T. Washington made one statement in his Up From Slavery that stood out like a bright star in the mind of this writer. He said that a man's success should be judged not by what he had achieved, but by the obstacles he has overcome. How true this is. We know a family here in New York City that owns many millions of dollars worth of the choicest property in the city, but not a single member of that family did anything to earn a cent of that money. The members of the family are considered successful. Booker T. Washington, starting as a slave who had never owned enough clothing to cover his body until he was a large boy, mastered obstacles that would cause most of us to throw up our hands and quit. He struggled in the face of two unusually difficult obstacles, race prejudice and poverty. Yet, in spite of all this handicap, he won a place for himself and for his race that many others with less obstacles to overcome might well envy. He was right. It is not what a man possesses in the way of material wealth that counts. It is what he overcomes in the way of obstacles. Read the Washington book. Take it away into some quiet corner and do some thinking as you read. Compare Washington's obstacles with some of your own, past or present, that you consider insurmountable. The reading of this book will prove to be a powerful inspiration to you. To read the book is both educational and interesting. Washington makes one laugh and he makes one cry. He tells of his first hat. Being too poor to buy a store hat, his mother made one for him out of two pieces of old cloth. When he appeared with it on, the other children who had boughten hats laughed and made fun of him. He relates, with no evident feeling of satisfaction, that in later years most of those who laughed at his hat found their way to the penitentiary or were still doing nothing to better themselves or their race. All who make writing their profession ought to read Up From Slavery. It is written in a style that makes one know that no facts are being withheld. Washington makes no attempt to shield either himself or his race, or to give prominence or undue credit to either. Logic runs all the way through it. Truth is evident on every page. Read it. Now is the time to take inventory of your past experiences and find out what you have learned that is of use to you and what you wish to accomplish while your candle is still burning.
Ask yourself these questions and insist on answers. What have I learned from my failures and mistakes that will be of service to me in the future? What have I done to entitle me to a higher position in life? What have I done to make the world a better place? What is education, and how can I educate myself? Does it profit me to strike back at those who have injured me? How can I find happiness? How can I succeed? What is success? Lastly, what main achievement do I wish to attain before I finally lay down the tools with which I am tinkering and pass over the great divide? What is my definite aim in life? Write out your answers to all of these questions and think before you write. The result may startle you. Because these questions, if carefully answered, will cause you to do more constructive thinking than the average person does in a whole lifetime. Do much thinking before you answer the last question. Find out what it really is that you want in life. Then, find out if it is apt to bring you happiness after you get it. The one object in life that transcends all others is that of finding happiness. Examine yourself and you will find that all of your motives lead finally in search of happiness. You want money so you can buy independence and happiness. You want a home and luxuries that you may be happy. And in your search for answers to these questions, you are sure to find that happiness, the genuine brand that satisfies and endures, comes only by giving it to others. By this route, you can find it without money and without price. The minute you deliver it to others through helpful service, you have it yourself in abundance. May it not be well if, in your decision as to your definite aim in life, you include happiness? In every normal mind, a sleeping genius lies, waiting for the gentle touch of strong desire to arouse it and put it into action. Listen, you sorrow-laden brothers who are groping for the pathway which leads out of the darkness of failure into the light of achievement, there is hope for you. It makes no difference how many are the failures you have undergone or how low you may have fallen. You can get on your feet again. The person who said that opportunity never knocks but once was woefully mistaken. Opportunity stands at your door day and night. True, she does not hammer at your door or try to break in the panels, but she is nonetheless there. What if you have undergone failure after failure? Every failure is but a blessing in disguise, a blessing that has tempered your mettle and prepared you for the next test. If you have never undergone failure, you are to be pitied, for you have missed one of nature's great processes of true education. What if you have erred in the past? Who of us has not done the same? Find the person who has never erred, and you will also find a person who has never done anything worth mentioning. The distance from where you now are to the place where you wish to be is but a hop, skip, and a jump. Possibly you have become a victim of habit, and, like many another, you have become enmeshed in a mediocre work life. Take courage. There is a way out. Perhaps fortune has passed you by and poverty has you within its grip. Take courage. There is a pathway to all that you can use intelligently and for your own good. And the chart of that pathway is so simple that we seriously doubt that you will make use of it. If you do, however, you are sure to be rewarded. The golden rule should be adopted as the business slogan of every business concern and professional man in America and printed as such on every letterhead. The forerunner to all human accomplishment is desire. So powerful is the human mind that it can produce the wealth you desire, the position you covet, the friendship you need, the qualities which are necessary for achievement in any worthwhile undertaking. There is a difference between wish and desire in the sense that we are here referring to it. A wish is merely the seed or germ of the thing wished for, while strong desire is the germ of the thing desired, plus the necessary fertile soil, the sunshine, and the rain for its development and growth. Strong desire is the mysterious force which arouses that sleeping genius reposing in the human brain, 
and puts it to work in earnest. Desire is the spark which bursts forth into a flame in the boiler of human effort and generates the steam with which to produce action. Life is made up of one long facing of decisions, of deciding promptly or letting the opportunity pass. Doing or failing to do may equally affect us for good or for ill. Character is built up by the influence on us of the endless chain of decisions we are called upon to make so long as life is in us. Many and varied are the influences which arouse desire and put it to work. Sometimes the death of a friend or relative will do it, while at other times financial reverses will have the right effect. Disappointment, sorrow, and adversities of every nature serve to arouse the human mind and cause it to function through new channels. When you come to understand that failure is only a temporary condition which arouses you to greater action, you will see, as plainly as you can see the sky on a clear day, that failure is a blessing in disguise. And when you come to look upon adversity and failure in this light, you will begin to come into the greatest power on the face of this earth. You will then actually begin to make capital out of failure instead of allowing it to drag you down. There is a happy day coming in your life. It's going to arrive when you discover that whatever you aspire to accomplish depends not upon others, but upon you. The arrival of this new day will be preceded by your discovery of the strength of desire. Start in now, right today, to create a strong and irrepressible desire for the station in life which you wish to attain. Make that desire so full and complete that it will absorb most of your thought. Dwell upon it by day and dream about it by night. Keep your mind focused on it during every spare moment. Write it out on paper and place it where you can see it at all times. Concentrate your every effort toward its realization, and lo, as if in response to the touch of a magic wand, it will materialize itself for you. Chapter 2. Self-Confidence The second signboard on the road to success is self-confidence. To be sure of success, you must believe in yourself. You cannot believe in yourself unless others believe in you also, and you cannot get others to believe in you unless you deserve it. If every person whom you met today would tell you that you look sick, you would have to have a doctor before night. If the next three people you speak to today should tell you that you look sick, you would begin to feel sick. On the other hand, if every person you see today should tell you what a likable person you are, it would influence you to believe in yourself. If your employer should compliment you each day and tell you what fine work you are doing, it would cause you to believe in yourself. If your fellow workmen should tell you each day that you are doing better work, this would make you have a greater confidence in yourself. We all need someone to believe in us and to encourage us. It has been said by those who know that a man's wife can lead him on to success by sending him away to his work each day with a glad smile and a word of encouragement. The man who created these signboards on the road to success gives much of the credit for his success to his wife. She sent him away to his work each day with this encouraging thought. You are going to do good work today. She never nagged at him. She never criticized him. She never scolded if he was late. She always told him what a bright man she thought he was. One day, she did a very unusual thing. She wrote out a creed for her husband to sign and hang in front of him where he could see it all day long while he was at work. This is a copy of the creed. It reads, I believe in myself. I believe in those who work with me. I believe in my employer. I believe in my friends. I believe in my family. I believe that God will lend me everything I need with which to succeed if I do my best to earn it through faithful, efficient, and honest service. I believe in prayer, and I will never close my eyes in sleep without praying for divine guidance to the end that I will be patient with other people and tolerant with those who do not think as I do. 
I believe that success is the result of intelligent effort and does not depend upon luck, sharp practices or double-crossing friends, fellow workmen or my employer. I believe that I will get out of life exactly what I put into it. Therefore, I will be careful to conduct myself toward others as I would be willing to have them act toward me. I will not slander those whom I do not like. I will not slight my work, no matter what I may see others doing. I will render the best service that is in me, because I have pledged myself to succeed in life, and I know that success is always the result of conscientious effort. Finally, I will forgive those who offend me, because I realize that I 